All right, network security attacks. So when we have our three goals, our confidentiality, our integrity, and our availability, if someone wants to attack our network, they go after one of these three areas. So if we have a confidential attack, a confidentiality attack, they're trying to go after making our confidential confidential data viewable by other by other people, either by themselves or by the world. With integrity, they're trying to alter our data, and with availability, they're trying to limit the access to the system or hurt the usability of the system. So if we're going after attacks on confidentiality, they may try to do packet capture where they're sniffing that packets and capturing them so that they can see what you were doing on the network. They might do a ping sweep or a port scan to try to determine what is on the network. They might do dumpster diving, and where that is is they're going to go in the dumpster and pull out printouts and disks and other things that are in your trash and try to put it back together. You can do wireless interception where you actually are capturing wireless data that's being floating around or even capture the EMI that's coming off of those cables capture that and re-put that back into packets. It's very difficult to do, but it can be done. Uh, there's wiretapping. They may actually tap your lines so they can get a copy of everything that's going across them. They can perform a man-in-the-middle attack, where essentially instead of you going directly to the web server, you go to them and they go to the web server on your behalf, almost like a proxy server, but you don't even know what's happening. And so everything you think you're sending to your bank is actually going through this middleman, and he's capturing all those, those passwords and data. Social engineering, they can use all sorts of different social engineering attacks against you, such as phishing, spear phishing, uh, using malware, uh, using phone calls and emails and other things to get data out of you that would normally be confidential and break that confidentiality. And then again, we can use malware and spyware because if I can get malicious software on your computer like a Trojan uh, or a remote access tool, I can start looking around your computer and get all your data. So these are all different ways to attack that confidentiality and make what should be hidden known to others. So here's an example of a tax on confidentiality. In this case, we're looking at stolen credit cards. So if we have an attacker that wants to exploit company A's website, they might use a trust relationship that was built between a target server and the web server itself. So if they can actually get in to a web server, they can then use the trust relationship to get the credit cards off the target server that's inside of the trusted network. And this is a way to make pivoting off of like a, a server that's a public facing server into a server that is not public facing. And so you've got to be worried about that. Now, once they've gotten that credit card off that target server, what are they going to want to do with it? They're going to want to go shopping. And so in this case, they might actually go and use it in the third step here and go up to the e-commerce server of company B, and they'll go ahead and use those credit cards there, and that way they've got more product to sell. When we look at attacks on integrity, we still have that man in the middle, because if I'm in the middle, I not only can see what you're doing, but I can change it on its way to the server. So if I'm in the man in the middle and you send a message to your bank saying transfer $500 to account 123, I might want to change that and say transfer $5,000 to account 456, being my bank account. A salami attack, it actually takes a lot of small attacks and puts them all together to make one big attack. Just like salami, you take lots of pieces of meat and put it all together to make one hunk of meat. Uh, data diddling is where we do changes to the data before it's actually stored on the hard drive. And so you have to actually uh, compromise their server to do this. Another thing we can do is trust relationship exploitation, like I showed you in the last slide. Uh, if one server is trusting another server, if we can compromise one server, we can then compromise both servers. We can do password attacks as well. We can use Trojan horses or packet captures, key loggers, brute force, or dictionary attacks to get somebody's password, which would be another attack on integrity. We also have botnets, where actually it can actually make your computer less uh, secure and use it as a way to pivot for attacks. And we also have a thing called session hijacking, where when you think you're communicating with a server, if I can steal your session, I can then take over that and start communicating on the web server. And the web server still believes I'm you, so I'm able to change the integrity of your data, uh, as you can see here in the image here. So when we talk about botnets, it is a form of an integrity attack, because botnets are software that lie on a compromised computer. So if you fell victim to, say, a spear phishing campaign or a phishing campaign, you may have clicked a link that installed this botnet on your computer. It now becomes part of the botnet, and it is what is called a zombie, and it will be controlled by a remote access server, and it will allow that to perform various attacks and functions for criminals. So in the picture here, you can see we have a cyber criminal who goes and sets up a command and control node. He then takes over a bunch of personal computers, and then can use those personal computers to perform an attack against all of the targets that he wants to go after. These are very common in doing denial of service attacks as well, or distributed denial of service attacks that we might do in the availability attacks as well. So if we have a confidentiality and integrity attack, such as a man in the middle, 
Here's an example that I was talking about with the banking. I have a banking customer who wants to put data in one, two, three, four, five. Instead, it actually goes to the man in the middle who changes it to account number 98765. When it goes into the banking server, that's what the transaction is going to show, and that data is going to go over there, and he's going to get the money. This is an attack on integrity, as well as confidentiality, because I'm seeing your account numbers as well as changing them. With your attacks on availability, we are concerned with them causing failure for us. So the attacks can come from consuming resources on a server to physically damaging the system. So we talked about there's denial of service and distributed denial of service attacks, where I take away resources from the computer so that it can't perform its function. A TCP SYN flood uses the SYN from the TCP handshake against the machine. And what essentially happens is you send a bunch of SYN requests, which if you remember from our three-way handshake, we do SYN. The server should then do SYN ACK. We should then ACK that SYN, right? So if I say, hey, I want to talk to you, server, the server says, okay, go ahead and talk. And then what do I do? I don't answer them. And I say, hey, I want to talk to you, server. Hey, I want to talk to you, server. Hey, I want to talk to you, server. Reminds me a lot of like a little kid when they go, hey mommy, hey mommy, hey mommy, hey mommy, hey mommy. And eventually it's like, what? And you have no resources to deal with anybody else because you have this thing pestering you the entire time. And that's what a TCP SYN flood does. Buffer overflow is when malicious code gets injected and it overflows the memory buffer so that you can take control of that system or crash that system. ICMP attacks such as Smurf is where it's, um, we are actually attacking it by overwhelming it with ICMP traffic. Uh, UDP attacks such as Fraggle can be used, very similar to a Smurf attack, but using UDP instead of ICMP traffic. There's a thing called the ping of death that used to be very effective, where you could send a ping message, and it was a malformed ping packet that would actually crash the receiver, and that would actually make their system either shut down or reboot. You can have electrical disturbances. So all these computers and servers all run off electricity. If I can turn off the power to that area, I can then have an availability issue for you, right? And the last thing is a physical environment attack. Again, computers need things like heating and cooling. If I can attack your HVAC system and your, your, um, your ventilation and air conditioning system and it goes down, your computers are going to have to shut themselves down or they're going to overheat and destroy themselves. So again, it's another way to attack the availability is attack the physical needs of these machines. So here's an example of a denial of service. We have an attacker who has a spoofed IP address. He sends this flood of requests towards the target server. Whenever the server tries to answer back, he's going to a spoof IP. He's not going to get the answer. And so we keep flooding the victim, the victim system with requests for services, and that system is going to end up being out of memory and crash. If we're doing a TCP flood, just like I said before, we're sending all these SINs to the server, and those requests that are coming back, we're not going to acknowledge. And by not acknowledging them, we never complete that three-way handshake. We use up all the resources on the system, and it can end up crashing the server. A smurf attack, as I said, was ICMP traffic. So in this case, we have an attacker who is going to send a ping message up into this subnet up here on the top. And when the subnet responds, we had spoofed our destination address, or excuse me, our source address. So instead of responding to the attacker, we instead respond to the server. And so this server is going to be overwhelmed by all of these, these ping replies that are coming uh, from the subnet that we targeted because we sent it to the broadcast and off it went flooding the server. Attacks on availability from electrical disturbances, this would be launched by interrupting or interfering the electrical services of a system. So if I can cause a power spike, an electrical surge, a power fault, a blackout, a power sag, or a brownout, this can cause issues for your servers. How do we combat that? We make sure that we're using uninterrupted power supplies, UPSs. We have line conditioners that can prevent the brownouts and the power sags. Uh, we can also use backup generators, so if we have a, a blackout, the generator will kick on and give us continual power until the machines come back on, until the electricity is restored, excuse me. So these are ways to overcome all those availability attacks that, that reference the electrical disturbances. Another attack that we can go after is the physical environment, like we said. All these computer systems need to have temperature and humidity control. And so if I can damage the HVAC system, I can overheat your systems. Or if I can uh, go after the humidity system, I can cause a high level of moisture or high level of humidity and that can cause shorts in your, system, in your system as well. Finally, we can inject gas into the environment, and the systems have electronics uh, running and power supplies. It could actually spark that, that vaporized gas and cause a fire. And again, this would cause a physical environment attack that would make your servers go down. Uh, these threats can be mitigated through physical restrictions, though, access credentials, and visual monitoring. So if I can keep the bad guys away from my systems, there's a good chance they're not going to be able to hurt them. 
and that is our network security attacks.